Well, hey, thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Brad and I'm uh, with the Fairfax County Master Gardeners. Um, I, um, I put up this presentation for backyard habitats. So it's gonna be stuff that we can each do in our own yards and things to be looking out for as you either plan your garden or are planning for other things throughout the season or even for next year or, or things that you can probably even start looking for even now. So one of the biggest things that we're gonna try and do is that we want to have a wildlife friendly yard. And that means all wildlife. While we do deal with our various pests, there are other things that we are trying to do to attract other wildlife. That would be anything from pollinators to more birds, even some of the wildlife, like even turtles and frogs, and maybe even some, some uh, white, uh, white field mice uh, would be something that you might wanna have around. But it's gonna come from these building blocks. And these building blocks that you're gonna be dealing with are gonna be shelter, food, uh, water, are the three main things. And then the other things are you gonna go for organic practices, which I'll get to later on, the way that you landscape, and then giving yourself an opportunity. It's your yard and you want to have a chance to observe what you see. You wanna give yourself some sight lines to be able to see what you are bringing to your yard. So we'll get into this. This is kind of what this is going to look like. Everybody's yard is gonna be different and based on where you are, whether you're, you're coming up against a riparian buffer or you're in an old growth forest around here, or even if you're in a suburban area, this is very, very possible. And I want everyone to understand that this is something that everyone can do in their yard. It is not something just left for people who have a large swath of land. I live in a townhouse HOA community. I have a posted stamp for a yard and I have tried to implement as many of these things as possible. And I am amazed at the kind of activity that I have from the different types of pollinators to the birds, even some of the wildlife that I've been able to hear or that has been affected by what I'm doing in my yard. So what we're looking at here is if you look at the very bottom of the screen, you're gonna start off with ground cover. And this is gonna be affecting things like sparrows, waterfowl, shorebirds. Some people who do live along lakes or if they have a shoreline property, you can also do this all the way up to the shoreline depending on what your regulations are. But here in Fairfax County, there's a lot of leeway that you can take with that in your yard. The next area is gonna be your understory. These are gonna be some trees and some shrubs. They can even be large shrubs that actually act as trees. We're talking maybe about 10, 12, possibly 15 feet, but these are gonna be areas where they're gonna be a little bit more shaded out. So this is not necessarily a woodland specific garden, but things that don't get a full amount of sun. This isn't your meadow areas. This is gonna be understory. So these are gonna be shaded out a little bit. So this is gonna be able to provide a lot of your songbirds as well as some of your um, scavenging type of birds that are around, um, but also they need a little bit of space up above the ground to build their nests and to have a secure spot. The next story is your mid story. This is for your jays, cardinals. These are, these are birds that need to build nests a little bit higher up. They're a little bit smaller in some cases like the chickadees that need to be able to be separated away from uh, any of the predators that are down below. The top level is up at your canopy. These are your owls and woodpeckers and some of your creepers, nut hatches. These are gonna need, um, like owls, they need a wide range, uh, very, very clear vision. They're gonna be able to see whatever their um, prey will be, but also it gives them a lot of security. And the kind of trees that you're gonna have here, these are gonna be your older trees. Some of these reach uh, heights of about 80 feet tall, but they also can support pollinators as well because some of the, the these species of pollinators will use these as larval host plants. And even if they're 80 feet tall, they'll still use them. Again, something else that this is gonna look like in a, in a more suburban area, you've got, you've got some turf, if you have some turf. Um, I am a, a non-turf person, but that doesn't mean that turf doesn't have its place. But if you, if you are taking your turf, you can take it to a certain part where you have your ground covers. And ground covers don't necessarily need to hug the ground. They can actually be up a little bit. So this is something that might be you know, not just on the ground at a couple inches, it could be six, eight, maybe even a foot, and that could still be considered a ground cover. On, honestly, a lot of the ground covers that you might have available to you will have a basal layer or, or a layer of leaves that will be lower to the ground, but they actually might have stalks of flowers that might, might, might come up to a foot high. And when they're done, you can always cut them down, but that's your ground, ground cover layer. <clears throat> your next layer could be your flowering perennials, anything that's gonna be above that area. And again, you're trying to keep these um, a little bit higher, keep the ground very, very well covered. So you have wildlife that's gonna see that as a good nesting and habitat shelter spot, but you also have a lot of food for them. So this is gonna be anything that like seeds, anything that provides berries, 
You can have smaller shrubs that only get to about four or five feet tall in this layer. Even though you're going to a shrub layer, the next layer, that, that is where you could go five to six to eight feet tall. Your trees are your next layer. Uh, and then every season you wanna have something blooming or something available. And that's from, in, in Virginia, it's really great to have something at least around March to about November. And there's a possibility that you can have things even longer depending on what your, what your gardening practices are. This is taken from Bringing Nature Home from Doug Tallamy, just to give you an insight into some of the woody plants and herbaceous plants that support a lot of pollinators. And a lot of these are native to here to Fairfax County. So you have a lot of these, um, these pollinator species and even birds that will use these to that are supported by some of these flowers. I mean, if you look at oaks, they're over 500. You look at goldenrods, they're 115. Just, to, just quickly, for those of you, goldenrods are not ragweed. Goldenrods and ragweed come out about the same time, but any of you, those of you that have seasonal allergies, it's more than likely the ragweed because ragweed falls, um, spends their pollen through wind and goldenrod is too sticky. It, it has to stick to things. So it's not the goldenrod, but they're a fantastic plant. Your aster family, your sunflowers and their herbaceous side, and then going over to your willow, your birches, um, crab apples, blueberries, they support a significant amount of pollinators. And these are all great plants that you can plant in, in your landscape. While some of the trees like the oaks might take a long time, decades, or generations to get to their full mature size, pollinators can start using them within the first year, if not the first few years of them being planted. So what we're gonna jump into now is food. So every, every thing that you wanna bring into your landscape for supporting wildlife, they're gonna need food. This goldfinch is seeking out some seeds. Goldfinches seem to be one of the few bird species that can actually feed seeds or seed types of foods to their young. So when you see them in your yard, you're gonna be leaving some of these um, seed heads up in the fall. You can even leave them up in the spring. You don't have to clean up everything. If you can leave some areas around your yard or be accepting of some areas around your yard, you don't have to even put up uh, bird, uh, bird feeders, which will help, but you don't always have to. Some of the other birds are gonna be chickadees that need really, really small uh, insects, and mostly they get from caterpillars. And if you have larval host plants of native plants for some of these larval um, caterpillars, you're gonna be able to have some chickadees around. The cedar waxwing is going after berries, and this, I think this is an uh, Amelkir uh, service berry. Um, they're gonna go after that. Um, it, it really provides them some great uh, food sources and good protein. An another thing that you're gonna notice, if you have berries coming out throughout various different times of the year, you're gonna find some of the migratory birds might come through your yard, which will be really great to see, and they're really fantastic. You wanna put uh, a berry tree or some tree like this that you might have at, at some point of the year near a window or near your patio, something that, where you can enjoy it as well, because they're gonna come through. If you like the berries, like we grow blueberries and the catbirds have been all over our plants right now, but I love it because I love seeing them there. And we've, we've been able to have a few, but perhaps I might try and scare them off every now and again so I can get some too. Um, some of the other birds are going after spiders. They'll go after little beetles. They'll go after some birds I've even seen going after aphids, depending on what kind of birds they are. So there's a lot of uh, activity in your yard that if you allow them to eat some, you'll actually see them a lot more. Um, some other foods, again, the goldfinch is going after seeds of the purple coneflower. You even have some woodpeckers going after sumac. Um, they don't necessarily have to go after beetles or they don't have to necessarily go after nectar, but they can find a lot of food sources throughout the year that they could really enjoy. Then you all, of course, you have your pollinators. This bee is covered in pollen. And if you have a lot of pollen and nectar sources, you're gonna see a lot of different types of bees. Um, we've got about 4,000 different types of native, native bees in the US and about 400 of those are here in Northern Virginia and in Virginia and about 150, 170 or so are here in Northern Virginia alone. So if you provide them with a lot of pollen and a lot of nectar sources, you're gonna see a lot of activity. And this also includes wasps. There's not every wasp is actually um, damaging to, to humans and they're not really that um, attracted to you. But there's also a lot of wasp looking bees that are, that are around here that you might be able to see but again, their activity is fantastic. Hummingbirds, uh, I know everyone loves to see some of the hummingbirds come around when they're migrating through. Um, these little guys will go after any kind of nectar source that you want. This is a red, uh, red monarda, so this is a monarda didyma. Oswego tea, um, bee balm is what they're going after. They also go after cardinal flower. You're gonna find mostly that birds are gonna go after red type flowers, especially if they're hummingbirds going after nectar. 
Bees do not see in the red spectrum, so they won't be going, you won't see a lot of bees on here. Um, you'll mostly see hummingbirds. If you have red types of flowers, or if red happens to be one of your favorite colors, then you'll mostly see birds coming through there if it's a nectar source. Again, <clears throat> leaving some of these plants, this is, a, this is a milkweed pod. These are all these oleander aphids. These are also a food source for lady, ladybird beetles, and they'll also be a food source, I'll get into it in a second, for lacewings. This is something that some people don't like seeing. They don't like seeing all the other insects or all the other things eating their plants. But if nothing's eating your plants, you're not actually providing a habitat in your garden. So uh, allowing yourself to allow some plants to have some aphids on them, to have a little bit of damage, you'll actually be benefiting more by bringing in the ladybugs and then you'll be bringing in some lacewings. This is over on the right-hand side. These are the lacewing eggs up in the top. That's an adult lacewing. And the bottom is the larva of the lacewing, also called the lions of the, of the, the habitat in your garden because they are voracious feeders and they will go after aphids like there's no tomorrow. So if you see these things, these are good things. These are great. Your, habit, your garden is bringing in all these beneficial insects and this is fantastic. I, unfortunately, it's a honeybee that got attacked by either a assassin bug or maybe a spider. But this is also great too, if you've got spiders in your yard, they actually need food too. Birds will come after them, birds will go after lacewings, birds will go after ladybugs. So you'll be bringing a lot of birds and you'll just can continue to support this life cycle. <clears throat> there you got a garden spider on the left and then a praying mantis, if you can kind of see it in my garden right here, there's a praying mantis that's looking for its next prey. It's sort of hidden underneath the leaves, but these are fantastic um, beneficial insects that you can bring in your garden. Next thing that you wanna be able to provide is water. Water is a great source, especially when it gets hot out. You wanna be able to provide water not only for the birds, but also for the bees. I've even seen some chipmunks and squirrels come to my little bird bath that I keep on the, on the patio um, and they just wanna come because they're also thirsty. Um, water can take many different forms. This is a very formal, very set up pond-like um, water source. The birds and uh, the bees will also be able to use this as well as any other butterflies that might need it. Now, some people might worry about mosquitoes, but one of the things that someone can do here is that if you're inviting the type of habitat that you want, you'll probably have frogs in here, or you might even have some, some toads that might come by and skirt around the sides. You could even have other birds that are going after, especially you'll have uh, dragonflies. And dragonfly larvae go after mosquito larvae. Um, you can always put BT dunks. Those are some uh, bacillus dunks that you can put in here if you're really that concerned with it. But having a, having a pond source like this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it also provides a lot of water for the habitat that you're trying to create. It can be a small pond. It can be something just right off the side of your property. It could also be a, a rain catchment area that you actually purposely want to keep the rain water there. If you even wanted to throw in a few goldfish, you can throw in a few goldfish here. Again, I wouldn't say releasing them into a lake or anything like that, but if this is in your own property, you could release goldfish and they'll go after the mosquito larvae as well. It can also be very small. This is another small little rain catchment that was built up in a small area. There's not a lot of space, but there's something that you guys, you can use in a, in a garden or have an idea for another type of water catchment. And you can always go for a bird bath. Um, uh, the different kinds of birds will love it. They'll love cooling off. They'll love cleaning themselves as they try and prune, but they'll also love it for getting some water when they really, really need it. The bees also need some water. This is a way to provide really, really um, good water sources for bees. You need to put some rocks or something that they can uh, sit on to get the water because sometimes they can get in there and they might drown if they didn't have anything to crawl out of. So providing this, super inexpensive. It's really like I've even used... Uh, chopsticks that I didn't use from a Chinese takeout and put it in my uh, little uh, small little bird bath so I can have something that uh, insects can crawl onto. Or it can be a little pie pan that you're not using uh, anymore with a few rocks in it or you can put some sand or some gravel in there that you might have. Anything that you have that's even um, sticks or twigs from uh, a recent pruning that you've done. The next thing you want to provide is shelter. Now you could go really wide range and have something like a pollinator house, uh, Airbnb, uh, if you really wanted to. Uh, some of these things uh, don't really necessarily provide the best habitat, but if something is, if you have an area in your yard and you can provide something like this, this is great. This gives a lot of nooks and crannies and a lot of things that they can burrow into, they can run, they can hide into, they can make nests into, and they can start the new generation. 
but these kinds of shelters are going to be something that they can uh, they can hide from predators. It can be something where they can seek shelter from the weather if they need to. <clears throat> a place to, for ground nesters to nest. So leaving some of that extra um, extra pruning to when the season is over, or if it's a migratory birds, if you can wait until fall to prune those out, or if you can wait to pick up the leaves until springtime that's also great ways that you can help these ground nesters out and that goes for insects too there's a lot of insects that use the ground to nest as well and then also a place in winter to find hiding spots so once all the leaves are gone there's birds that stay around here all year round cardinals are one of those providing them a little space in your yard that is a little bit uh not uh not so pruned up and kempt will provide them a great habitat uh, when the when the leaves are gone Habitat isn't just above the ground, it's below the ground too. We have this amazing ecosystem that's down in our soils. And if you can help them out by providing them leaf litter, by providing some um, just ways that they can actually move in and out. I know I hate, I hate slugs on my vegetable crops uh, just like the next person, but if they're there, that means that something else might be able to eat them. If I don't get a lot of snails, but I do get some uh, centipedes and some millipedes, but I love this, seeing this kind of activity. Um, if you can dig in the ground and you see some worms, that's also a really great thing. You can encourage them to be there by leaving some of your plants just sitting there. Now, if it's diseased and you had to print it, print it out because of a fungus or something else that was going wrong, then we, then we really would recommend that you remove it, but you could also leave some of this there. Some of these other shelters can be something like broken up pots. You don't always need to throw them away. You can just throw them in your garden and who knows, might might use them. Uh, frogs will use these, but essentially it gives them a place where they can feel secure. And it can be as simple as, as just putting it in your ground and just letting the mulch and letting the dirt over time just kind of fill in. These are also habitats that are a little bit bigger. Some of the bee hotels over on the right hand side, these do work out really well, but I would encourage anyone who's doing this to definitely give it a shot. You'll be getting some mason bees who will use some, uh, some sand and some grit and some dirt from your yard to go in here, but they'll also be able to have some leaf cutter bees that'll be cutting little spherical leaves out of your plants and they'll be able to be in here too. The only thing I would recommend also is that if you're gonna go this route that you find a way to clean it out every now and again. Periodically, you can get some fungus in here, you can get some um, just some nasty, just gross things that'll be in here and it won't be really helpful for the bees it, despite the efforts that you're putting into it. This is super easy to do. Also snags, anything that's um, a little bit of uh, an old stump or some um, flowers, stalks that you left up from the spring or from the fall, you can leave those up and that can be used for, as a habitat as well for shelter. You can even throw some of your twigs out in the, in the back 40 of your yard if you have some space to do that and definitely leaving the leaves. Leaving the leaves in the, in the fall is not a bad thing. If you wanna chop them up, great, but a lot of times there's a lot of um, moth and butterfly species that use the leaves for shelter in the winter time. Rocks will also help out. <clears throat> and again, these uh, shelters are places to raise young. You can put up bird boxes, you can put up owl boxes, you can put up uh, a variety of different ways to bring in some uh, sheltering birds that need the space for their young. <clears throat> you can use a variety. I've shown lots of pictures of these kinds of bee boxes and insect boxes. But keep in mind also, there's a lot of our native bees that are ground nesting. They actually don't need to come up uh, from the ground into these little boxes or um, stalks or uh, twigs, but they need spaces in the ground. If you have some um, areas in your yard that you are okay with leaving unmulched and just bare dirt, that'd be great. Now, could weeds come in there? Sure, but um, for the most part, if you're allowing some, some of the areas to stay a little bit untouched, you'll get a lot of native bees. Native bees also use a lot of native grasses. I've seen a lot of bee species use um, prairie drop seed, little blue stem. They'll go into where the, the leaves are in the fall and they'll use that as a nest uh, for their babies for next spring. Again, leaves, recognizing also that <clears throat> some, of these, some of these nesting sites are really, really tiny. This is a hummingbird nest down in the bottom right and that's a, that's a, a dollar or a, a quarter that's right next to it. <clears throat> so be careful when you're pruning you might actually be inadvertently cutting out uh, somebody's nest. <clears throat> and this is, a, um, this is a swallowtail caterpillar. A lot of caterpillars that we are most familiar with, like the monarch, they will actually go through their entire life cycle in one season and then you'll be able to see the butterfly. Swallowtails and some other um, 
moth species don't do that. They actually make this cocoon and this cocoon will last until next spring. They will hatch out in the spring. So they need about six months or so before they'll actually be able to come out again. Frogs need space too, as well as any sort of holes or other snags in, in, your, um, in some of your branches or your twigs for other birds to nest in. Sustainable practices. This is another thing to sort of go for full circle is to employing practices that um, you can at least employ a couple of these things, uh, whether it's soil and water conservation for collecting your water or making sure water doesn't stay stagnant, but actually trying to use that and stay, keep it on your property, keep it in your soil is the best thing you can do. If that is even just slowing it down, just slow it down into certain areas. You can plant certain plants in there to really slow that water down or even have like a, a couple of rocks in places to make sure the water stays, stays put. Controlling exotic species, making sure that none of the invasives are in your yard. And if they are trying to remove them as best as you can and to replace some that may have um, gone ab above and beyond what they were intended for in the plant tag that you bought, but perhaps replacing them with some natives would actually be helpful too. And using organic practices when it comes to pesticides and herbicides. If you must use any, any sort of spray, please, please, please use the label, read the label. If you're unsure, ask someone professionally to come and do it. But there's a lot of ways that we can actually keep track of pests in our yard without having to spray anything. And it's actually a lot easier than you think. Um, some of the other ways that you can do this is you can mow less often. You can let the grass grow a little bit taller. Three to four inches is really a good recommendation or you could replace your lawn altogether. And you can, there's actually a lot of lawn species or grass type species that are in the Carex or Sedge family that actually can grow about six feet tall and that's it. And then you'll never have to mow again. It's kind of nice. Native plants really, really help. They're really well suited for this area. You still have to maintain and water them and keep track of them if you put them in brand new. But for the most part, native plants are really gonna do the supporting that you need. They give the, the, um, the native uh, species a home, they give them food. They also are able to uh, deal with the weather patterns that we have, as well as the, so the lack of water or abundance of water that we might get. And again, with the pesticides, if you can not use any of the pesticides, and pesticides is general, it's of, of any of the bugs that you might have or any of the weeds that you might have, any sort of side, if you can sort of be okay with allowing some of these things to not be used, there's a lot of organic ways that you can go about eradicating them if you need to. <clears throat> Leaving some stuff up in the winter time will be really, really helpful. Some plants are actually designed for this and some people want them for, for this purpose. But this actually can be very beneficial because some of these plants that you might leave up in the fall and the winter have really, really great colors. It's not just all brown. You can get some gold, some oranges, some yellows, some ochres, some really, really nice structure to a winter garden that could look really kind of fun. This is some more um, plants that have been left up after the season. And also some of these berries only come out in the winter time. So birds that are, that are still here, they need this for their, uh, for their fat stores. Another winter part of the garden. So this is essentially what a, what a yard can look like if you're employing most of these practices. You've got a wide range of plants that are blooming and, and growing at different seasons, uh, pro providing pollen and nectar all throughout the seasons. You've got shelter, you've got areas that are really well planted with a lot of, of plants in various different heights and different structures. You've got some places where um, some animals can go and hide, some places that they can find shelter, some places that can find nests and create nests, and some other areas where they can find food. There's also a lot of programs that you can get into that if you um, look into for wildlife habitat certification, monarch way stations, Audubon at home, pollinator habitats, if you're following some of these practices, you can get one of these signs to show your, your neighbors and people who visit your yard that these are practices that you're employing because this matters to you. And this is something that you, know, you can track and that you can actually uh, have some metrics to say, hey, here's some things that I can do now. Here's some things I can do over time that are really, really helpful.